Here. 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 Right. We um, are going to have a discussion, a workshop on possible bond projects, and then we'll break uh, for dinner and then come back down for workshops on Denver water and community engagement. So, Mr. Devin. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, our um, focus tonight at the four o'clock session is to give you uh, updated information regarding possible bond projects um, updates. Uh, and uh, we have um, uh, prepared a presentation. Uh, Director of Finance Brian Archer will lead the presentation and then a, a few others will be jumping in, including uh, uh, Director of Public Works Bob Manwaring and myself. Uh, so if uh, it's okay with all of you, we'd like to go ahead and have Brian uh, start the presentation and uh, uh, throughout this presentation, we'll be happy to answer any questions or provide you with any clarifying information. Very good. Mr. Archer. Thank you all. Appreciate uh, coming down early. So Mayor and Council, we're excited to continue the conversation. I think we started back in November of 2017 around possible projects and possible debt financing. We heard clearly from the council that they would like, that you would like additional information on three specific projects. That would be Ralston Road, 72nd Avenue, and the Myers Pool. What you will see is we're gonna kind of split these into two categories. One, talk a little bit about the transportation projects, and then secondarily, talk a little bit about Myers Pool. One of the other items we heard from council at our last presentation is that you would like us to bring back to you some funding possibilities and ways that we could um, get these projects done. As Mr. Devin said, we do want to make this interactive, so if there are questions along the way, please stop me. Um, the experts are in the room, and we will make sure that they can answer the questions that you have. The first project to take a look at is Ralston Road. What you see is a preliminary design that was created way back in around 2007. It shows five segments along Ralston Road. This is widening, improving, adding bike lanes, et cetera. And this runs if we're going from east to west, from basically Wadsworth Bypass to Kipling. What we're talking about specifically tonight is the middle two segments, segment three and segment four. We are excited to make reference that segment one, segment two, and segment five have a funding source, in some cases have already been completed, Segment three and segment four is what we need to look at to complete this entire project. We should mention that Ralston Road was the number one project both in the 2008 and 2015 CIP, citizen CIP pro, uh, process. The two middle segments are estimated to cost approximately 15.3 million, take roughly three years. We do wanna make note that we would need to hire an outside consultant to help with design. And we would also need some additional in-house staffing, both on this project and on the 72nd and Avenue project. As I have discussed, here are your five segments. Completed or in progress are Wadsworth to Yukon. That is a federal grant that we received two years ago. Garrison to Independence and Independence to Kipling were both completed through the Aura redevelopment. Independence to Kipling paid for by the Herb Renewal and then garrison to independence paid for by the developers as they're developing each one of those individual properties. Again, that leaves us Yukon to car and car to garrison. Those are the items that we are talking about tonight. This is a quick cross section of what the road may look like. You will see two items here, one with a detached sidewalk, the secondary with an attached sidewalk, it is my understanding that the attached sidewalk is the preferred. Is that correct? We're needing a little attached sidewalk. walk to avoid any kind of excess, to excess taking of property. As Bob made reference to that, one of the items and one of the questions that we had along the way is what kind of right of way would need to be acquired? By making it an attached sidewalk, that should reduce the amount of right-of-way. About three years ago, each one of the property owners along this corridor were talked to. 
and discussed about the possibility of future expansion of Ralston Road. Obviously, in a three-year period of time is a long time with property, and many of these owners have changed hands. It would be our plan, assuming City Council gives permission, and this project was approved by the voters, funding was approved by the voters, to go out and discuss with each one of the property owners again how much property we would need to acquire. It should be noted that internally, through the public works and the traffic programs, that they did try unsuccessfully to receive grant funding for the remaining sections. Those two sections did not compete very well. We do not have any applications in at this point in time. That does not mean we will stop. As we continue to move on with this project, whether we get approval for the financing or we do not get approval for the financing, we will continue to try to get grant funding to add to the dollars. Finally, here's a conceptual design around Dover Street. I know this is a little difficult to read, but you can see that by only doing the attached sidewalk, the amount of take from each of the property owners is limited, and we would not end up with any, to repeat what Bob said, 100% takes of any properties. Any questions on Ralston Road before we move on to 72nd Avenue? What's the, um, at, at our worst point on Ralston right now, how narrow are the lanes? How much are we gonna gain from it? The lanes today, uh, Mr. Williams, are somewhere around nine to nine and a half feet. Okay. Um, and the buses are currently traveling within the gutter itself as they travel on the outside lanes. So we'd be shooting for 12 foot lanes on that outside lane to accommodate the buses. And that's gonna be pretty uniform throughout? To through get the to whole the, corridor, yes. Through the whole corridor, we'll get the 11 foot and 12 foot lanes? Yes, sir. Excellent. Good. Uh, Ms. Ford? Brian, what's the difference in width on the, uh, on the attached versus the detached sidewalks? So the detached measures 88 feet wide per this spec, and the attached measures 78 feet wide. Okay, thank you. I assume you just did that in your head. No, I, I added that up earlier. <laughs> Good. Okay, I don't see It was the same question I had, so. Yeah. I don't see any other questions on, on Ralston Road. Obviously, it's been a project that's been top priority for our um, Citizen Advisory Committee for the CIPs. Um, so it's good that we're looking at a way to finally get the last segments done. Okay, 72nd so Avenue. So the next project is 72nd Avenue. What you see in front of you is a Google shot of going from east to west, Kipling to Indiana. Um, Google says that should take approximately six minutes, roughly three miles to drive. For any of you that have driven that road, if you can make it through there in six minutes, I think our police department would like to talk to you. Not only that, there are many, many pinch points along the way. What we're here to talk about tonight is the entire road and then specifically the farther, farthest, most eastern portion, which really runs from Kipling to Oak. Estimated to do the entire road would be 97.5 million, would take greater than five years, again, would require outside consultant help and in-house help. So as we discussed on Ralston Road, we're definitely going to need some sort of inspector, some sort of in-house engineer to help complete these projects. We'd like to talk about this in four different segments. Kipling to Oak, Oak to Sims, Sims to Ward, Ward to Indiana. Those are the estimated costs on each one of those segments. We'll dive a little bit deeper. Kipling to Oak, approximately 53 million. Time frame three to five years. That is a rough guess. The challenge with that is that is an underpass. We are dealing with the railroad. We have a significant pinch point there. We do have some right away, we'll talk about that. We know we have a water challenge. We know we would have a traffic routing challenge. This morning I learned that that is called a, hold on, I wrote it down, a shoe fly. It's all right. So um, I'm gonna look to Bob to describe that, but basically 
the way a finance guy would describe that, is that's the way to drive around the road, around the train, while we're putting the underpass in. Does that work, Bob? That's correct. As you will recall, when we did the Wadsworth grade separation, we took Wadsworth and moved it to the east. Do the same kind of effect here. Now, whether it goes one side or the other, uh, both the railroad and the road are going to have to be sh shoe flight. And so it's going to uh, become incumbent on the contractor to decide how he or she wants to work that shoe fly around the other facility. So we'll have a double set of tracks for a little bit of time like we did out here. What you will see is a cross section of the proposed road. You will notice that there is no landscape buffer around this cross section, but it does allow both pedestrian, bicycle traffic, and two lanes in both directions, removing that pain point of the current at-grade railroad crossing. It's a significant dig. Next, you will see the properties that will be directly affected by this. Each of the properties listed, and I would call that purple, are properties that would have a complete take with, I'm sorry, properties that are purple that also have the crosshairs. I don't know if you can see that, would have a complete take. The other properties that do not have a crosshair would have a partial take. Right. Brian, I'll go ahead and jump in Thank you. on this one. Uh, so we, uh, Mr. Devin and I and Mr. Knight have met with the property owners out here. There are some in the audience tonight. We've met with each and every one of them that you see uh, on that diagram there. Uh, the Boyds, the Bakers, uh, uh, Sutherland's, Mitchell's, Mills, uh, and the Russells. And we've explained to them what we're doing here in, in, in our last meeting with you uh, Mr. Devin and I explained uh, uh, what you're seeing on this aerial photo is the white cross hatched area sidewalk and the blue green line is where the retaining walls are going to be. So we've met with each folk, uh, each of the property owners and told them what we're planning to do. Um, the cross hatched yellow areas are potential full, full takes. Clearly the, where the retaining wall is that you see in the picture, they will lose their access to 72nd. Uh, so that's certainly impactful. The brown line, as we talked in a previous meeting, uh, is where the fencing will be. Uh, we still have to discuss how we work out some of those larger parcels, um, such as where the Mitchells are and where the Russells are, and how those might be incorporated in the project so there's not a full taking there in the yellow cross-etched area. As we would continue down 72nd Avenue, moving east to west, the next section would be Oak to Sims. Again, approximately $11.5 million, a shorter time frame, because what we're dealing with here is specifically right away, road closure and improvement to the intersection. Would not be dealing with any property takes, any total property takes, or any other concerns related to the railroad. This would be a quick look at that section Again, a widening going from the current to the future. As you can see, it is a significant road, would need widening. Brian, can I ask you a question? <clears throat> On the, uh, this first segment, uh, Kipling to Oak Street, does that include the intersection at Oak, or does this second section include the intersection at Oak, or is that split in the middle and the cost for that intersection part on each or? You would take into the full account Oak and we taper out of that towards Sims. So the this first section would include the intersection at Oak and taper out after that? Correct. Okay. Thank you. As we continue, you then have Sims to Ward. Similar challenges. We do have a ditch that is involved in that area though we have less right away to acquire. This section should be a little quicker, more of a two to three year time period. An estimated cost at right at 11 million. Again, a visual, um, same answer to your question, Councilmember Maria. And then the final piece would be Ward to Indiana. A little bit larger from a right-of-way perspective, would involve some work with the Apex facility. 
and we do have some routing issues along this corridor. Again, a quick overview. So any questions about the 72nd Avenue piece before we move to talking a little bit about financing? Yep, Mr. Piper. Sorry, I was raising my hand all of a sudden. Sorry, Sorry we have a little light. Uh, hey, so going back to the 72nd, the uh, grade separation, why do we need a 14 foot uh, median? And the rest of the uh, illustrations show maybe two, three feet. We have to allow room in there for what, would pro what will more than likely be a center pier and room to get around that. Um, that's about a bare minimum for lane transition from uh, the standard two lanes in each direction to, uh, to separation from the pier itself. We need a certain amount of clear area from that pier. Okay. And, and is there any thought instead of doing a bike lane that it could be a shared um, sidewalk? Maybe just striped to be bicycle and pedestrian? Uh, just to well, kind of save on, where I'm going is, is I'm trying to figure out if there's a way to reduce that because if we can go back to the properties, I, I'd like to- it won't, save any, it won't save a lot of property in the sense that um, we still take out access to a couple of those properties. It's gone irrespective of, the, of any kind of width on the road, right? So, um, those two middle properties, if you will, there's no access to 72nd at that point. There may be off the back of the Mitchell's property, um, but not off the back of, um, I believe that's the Mills, and I can't quite read that. So it doesn't save that type of thing. It might save a little bit, um, and in reality, it would come off of both sides, so you're really saving about four feet, four or five feet. On each side or just in total? Uh, on each side. Uh, well, I guess the question, well, then let me ask you about the uh, retaining wall there in front of the Mills house and mm -hmm. partially and the uh, Mitchells. Is that fairly, the elevation the same as the street of, I can't read, I can't read which street that is. 70th Drive across yeah. the street? Yeah. And because I see the retaining wall stop before there, but the, I don't know, 10 times I drive through that that area a day, it just seems like it's level. So I'm trying to understand the um, retaining walls that are needed in front of the Mills property and the, the Mitchells. Well, that's certainly, that's, you can judge it as, that's where we start having to, require to start getting under the railroad track. Um, but wouldn't that impact the uh, road as well? Oh, 70th Drive? Yeah. Um, yes, it will. So you may have to go back a little bit on 70th Drive to get that to match in. Oh, so you're going to cut the Yeah, we cut might have road, to cut back cut a little bit on Sim Truck. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I get you now. Yeah, I was just trying to understand the elevations mm -hmm, but sure. on both sides of the road. Mm -hmm. uh, right here. Okay. Uh, that's all the questions I have for now. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions, so you can. So I wanted to. Financing analysis. Well, I want to stop here and just talk about this slide, and then we will wrap this slide up again later on. So when we brought to city council our original um, financing proposals, we have um, approximately $4.5 million in annual debt service that will expire at the end of this year. So you will see what we could bond for if we kept that number the same. That is the 65 million with a total payback of about 90 million. Since revisiting this number and redoing our estimates for our 10-year financial plan, we've been able to identify an approximately $250,000 of additional revenue. Where this comes from is as our sales tax grows, the city council remembers 20% of any dollar that we bring in or 20 cents on the dollar has to be spent either on debt or capital items. And the debt needs to be capital specific. And so as our sales tax, has, sales task, tax numbers have changed, we now can comfortably identify approximately $4.7 million or $69 million in principle that we could do without making changes to anything else. What you will see at the bottom with this highlighted yellow number at $6 million reflects what it would cost in an annual debt payment, an annual um, principal and interest payment to do all of these projects. 
now not all of 72nd Avenue, but to do Ralston Road, to do the first section of 72nd, and to do the Myers Pool. So just put that in the back of your mind. We're gonna to go to the next, talk about Myers Pool, and then we'll give a recommendation from staff on how we think we should finance these three projects. So next you will see is Myers Pool. Myers Pool has been falling down for quite some time. Uh, approximately four years ago, Mr. Devin, was it four years ago or five years ago that we put in significant amount of money because the pool, we had to close the pool and put in significant resources to keep it open. It was closer to six years ago. Oh man, okay, closer to six years ago. We had to close the pool for almost three months, put in significant improvements to keep the doors open. We are now looking at the same situation related to the roof with no guarantee that that would last for any period of time. So we are here to city council to propose adding Myers Pool to the list of capital projects for 2019. Estimated cost of approximately 35 million. Timeline minimum three years. We would need outside consultant help to design and run the project. Included in the current plan would be two tanks, one a competition tank at 50 meters, secondarily a what we would call warm tank that can be used for learning how to swim, activities related to the pool, and basically enjoying warmer water. My understanding is when you swim, you need the water to be colder at a competition level, but when you're out for enjoying or just out to take a dip in the pool, you want it to be a little bit warmer. Those are in competition of each other right now in the current Myers pool. The new building also proposes a separate spectator seating above the pool deck. I was shared a couple of stories about interactions between the competitors and spectators because now they sit around the pool. That is a dangerous situation. You wanna get the spectators up and away from the competitors and the coaches. Also, the current design allows for increased parking on the site today, if they have an event, they need to park in the neighborhoods, park down the hill in the target parking lot, et cetera. There are three proposed locations where it is at now. That offers somewhat of a challenge because you would have to take the pool down, scrape the site, redesign, rebuild the pool. That would put both the people that use the pool from a competition perspective and the people that use it for recreation without it for a minimum of three years. Second site is at Panorama Park, which is approximately east of Indiana and at West 90th Avenue. This is a greenfield park, would allow the ability to build the pool without having to take the current pool down. Third site would be Gibbs West Park, which is east of the Apex Center that is owned by the city, quite large, and could be placed anywhere in that. We talked a little bit about the option of keeping the doors open. Right now, the estimated cost would be approximately 3.2 million to fix the roof. This would buy us between five and 10 years, but has no guarantee. We could literally make this repair and the pool could fall apart the next day. I am excited to announce that we have had ongoing conversations with Jefferson County Public Schools to work on a partnership on replacing this pool. Uh, as it sits right now, we are proposing a 50-50 partnership with them. We are hoping to move forward with that depending on what city council desires. Okay, Ms. Ford. Brian, what's the acreage on the current site? Oh. Six and a half, I think. I think it's, it's six approximately and a half. six and a half, seven acres. And Mr. Pfeiffer, uh, is there a dive component still with the new? Did we know if we are including that? There is a dive component, but I do not think it includes the taller dive. That was one of the questions that was still being worked out with the the members. Okay. I know for certain they were going to have the lower dive board, but they were still discussing the higher dive. I guess there's not very many people that use that anymore, so the cost and the insurance, they were weighing whether it would make sense or not. But I don't think that decision has been finalized. 
Yeah, I, I just a, a comment on your very last line, I guess, about the three million. Um, we've already spent a lot of money just to get five years, and uh, this is a money pit the way it's set up right now. I don't want to throw any more money towards this to get another yeah. one to ten years, yeah. you know, at it because I can't believe it's six years last time we we put money into this. I can't believe that time's passed. That time flies yeah. when you're having fun. Yeah. Oof. Um, I think it I felt like it was yesterday. Yeah. But. Yeah, and, and you, you recall, Councilmember Pfeiffer, that that um, uh, that pool was closed. We had a lot of concern from the uh, aqua, you know, the swim team community about mm -hmm. the fact that they literally lost that facility for about three months. We really couldn't find them alternative uh, water for them to uh, uh, to uh, work out, you know, practice. Uh, so, um, and, and, and the analysis that Apex has commissioned to just you know, as an alternative to see about just you know going as long as possible with the uh, existing facility points out that that three million dollars could fix a lot of the problems but the structure still will deteriorate and as a result it will eventually come down at some point in time it would really be a sunk investment yeah can you remind me how much we spent on that six years ago do you remember the first repair to just oh, the first repair? Yeah, to kick the can. Um, I think uh, I think us and Apex uh, probably combined spent uh, close to two million dollars. Okay. Yeah. And I, it should be noted that Apex does spend significant dollars each year on the maintenance side to keep the pool open as well. I don't have those numbers, but as part of our agreement with them, they also put resources into the pool well, each one th year. One thing you can learn from history is don't build a, an aquatic center with wood. Wood roof. <laughs> Yep, Mr. Jones. On the new site, I know that obviously the the sites one and two, 11, 11 acres and 94 acres. Is there any preliminary thought around how many acres so that we have sufficient parking and all of that? I, I would say, you know, we haven't studied this in depth yet, but I would say the 11 acres is probably about as as low as we would want to go from a site standpoint in order to accommodate acres. That's another reason why the existing site, I think, is a little bit concerning for us, is that if we build the level of spectator seating that's mm -hmm. desired, I think that, that, um, uh, that trying to keep the, the pool on the existing site will uh, create some problems for the neighborhood when they when large meets are held I think I don't think it will be able to accommodate all of the parking and right. I think a lot of the parking will flow into the neighborhoods which oftentimes can cause a lot of complaints from the neighbors and Nancy's question was the current site is like almost three acres no. is that what you so, about six, six and a half six and a half to seven that's what yeah. I'm not listening pay thank attention you. thank you uh, um, do we have numbers on how many people use Myers Pool? And if not, we need to get them? Yeah, a Apex, Apex is providing that information to okay. us. We do not have it right now. Okay. Both in terms of both just citizen usage, you know, for recreation and then what the school usage is for the, for the, both for training and competitions and everything. I think we need to know that as part of the analysis of, you know, getting bang for our bucks. Yeah, Bob. Yeah, I just want to make one comment about your locations. I think the Gib West makes some sense to me. Uh, one, it's close to our regional parks of Stanger and Lutz, um, and an easy access uh, for there. Because I know there's been a lot of desire to maybe expand that park over there, or do something with it, you know. And I think this would be a good home for it. So. And is that the property due east of the Apex Center, so fronting on to 72nd Avenue? Okay. Okay, other questions from council? Don't see any. Okay, I'd like to continue the funding conversation. So what you'll notice, and this is a little hard to read, is that we have split the projects into two buckets. One, I'm gonna call our transportation bucket, and the second, I'm gonna call the pool. If you notice, uh, the transportation bucket is listed in blue. What staff is proposing to city council is that we would take these two projects to a vote. This would need to go to the citizens. We would sell the bonds publicly, and we would issue approximately $4.5 million in debt. This would return us approximately $69 million in proceeds, allowing us to accomplish Ralston Road and, at minimum, the first section of 72nd, basically the underpass 
under the railroad. Those two projects combined add up to roughly 68 million. And so that's how we would propose accomplishing the transportation projects. Since we are in current negotiations with the school district, we would like to propose that instead of issuing debt through a public process, we would issue a COP to pay for this pool. What this will allow us to do is have greater flexibility. If the school district is not able to get financing, it would not lock us into our half of the pool. We could issue the loan directly, work on our terms and our payment agreement. Estimated cost is about $1.5 million annually. That's just our half, right? That would be our half, thank okay. you. That would be our half on the 35 million, or roughly 17 and a half million would be our share. Any questions on this? Well, I'm gonna throw one at you here. Okay. Um, what if we went for a, a, do the bank loan for the pool, but perhaps you can find some additional dollars, because you're good at it, <laughs> uh, to increase the annual um, bond payment uh, so that we could get more of 72nd Avenue done at the same time? That's a good question. Um, that leads me into how we were going to find the funding for mm -hmm. the current proposal. So as you see on the slide right now, we currently put approximately $10 million each year towards our required 98-101 financing. Again, that's the 20% of each dollar of sales tax that we bring in. That is programmed throughout the 10 years and is programmed in these areas. The four and a half million for debt that we talked about, money for public art, money for transportation, money for fiber, for parks, and then what I'm gonna list as specific projects. Now these specific projects range from funding related to Ralston Road, there's about a million dollars in there. Money that was identified during the last 10 year CIP plan to go towards arterial streets. Now we had not identified what arterial streets those would be, just that we knew we needed upgrades to arterial streets throughout the city. Money that was identified for sidewalks, money that was identified for trails. Again, none of those projects are programmed. They were just put in buckets. So we could certainly look at that line item to add funding, Mayor, to the debt issue. Another area that we've talked about relates to something we call the vendor fee. This would be a reduction in the vendor fee. What the vendor fee is, is if you are a business in the city and you collect and remit your sales tax by the 20th of the month, we allow you to keep 3%, no greater than $100 monthly, for your cost to process and remit that sales tax to the city. Total, that is about $550,000 per year. We could look at reducing or changing that vendor fee. And if that's something council would be interested in, we certainly could go in depth on that at a later time. Beyond that, any additional... I have a quick question uh, about sure. the vendor Sorry. fee there. Uh, how many communities are doing something similar to, to what we do? It's a split. So many communities eliminated the vendor fee during the Great Recession. Uh, council directed us to keep it to kind of help businesses get through that period of time. Um, but it's really 50-50. Some are still doing it, and many have eliminated it permanently. And the reason behind eliminating it is the processing has changed. So for example, at the city of Arvada, we now require vendors to remit 100% electronically. So they don't need to fill out the paperwork anymore, and they can pay electronically. So we've tried to reduce the amount of time that they have to spend filling out forms, writing a check, et cetera. And so the need for the vendor fee has gone away. That's what a lot of communities are using for their justification. Got a couple more questions up here. Dot Miller. 
Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to chat a little bit about the specific projects and how much of that, if percentage if you know, would go to, towards transportation. Because I feel like right now we're still underfunded on transportation and sometimes those special projects with the, um, with the streets. So can you speak to a little bit about sure. that and, and how much of that would we lose from transportation Absolutely. and put to a pool? Absolutely, that's a great question. So this would not affect any of the money that we've put aside or set up for um, road maintenance. So this year we created a fund specifically for street maintenance and we funded it at approximately $10 million per year. This proposal would not change that at all. Those funds would not be affected by no matter what decision council makes. What you see here, Councilmember Miller, is related to future, what I would call capital hard projects. For example, uh, changing a light at 58th and Ward, mm -hmm. or adding part of a road, um, updating the intersection at 56th and Sheridan, those kinds of projects. Nothing to do with road maintenance. What percentage of that number was going towards transportation type projects? probably 80%. Some of that funding in the future is related to replacement of some parks, but that really starts out in 2024 and beyond. Thank you. So we are gonna lose some money towards pr transportation. From a capital perspective, that is yes. Well, unless we put those monies into the road projects. Right, you would be changing how those dollars would be used. Instead of towards specific 58th and Ward, you'd be using them towards 72nd Avenue. Right. Mr. McGough? Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Archer, just to back up a little bit, uh, let me get the question in at the appropriate time, but if we were to finance um, uh, our half of the pool, $17.5 million with a certificate of participation, and the, uh, the payback is, uh, what was that? And uh, is that per? Is, uh, you had the amount there per uh, per, uh, per year. How many years of uh, finance? That would be a twenty year. Twenty years. Yes. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. That answers that. Mr. Marriott, I had a question. We kind of follow that up, Mr. Archer. The uh, you had mentioned um, in the possible funding strategies for the pool. One is to issue certificates of participation, which we've done before on. A couple of other things, and I think that's been tested and doesn't, you know, falls within the constraints of Tabor. Well, what about just a bank loan? Is that that is that the same? Or same. They lump those into the same because of the annual appropriation. So when you do a COP or a bank loan or okay. a private placement, you put the clause on there that they're subject to annual appropriation, and therefore then they're not subject to Tabor. Okay. So good question. Okay. Thank Great. you, Ms. Ford. So, Brian, um, you mentioned that um, we can do the pool based on the 20% um, with the capital, um, with the fund that, you know, the 20% from the sales tax that goes into the 98 fund. If we had some bad years within those 20 years, do, is there any cushioning anywhere uh, that we would not strap ourselves so close, closely that you know we would yep. have some financial issues? That's a great question. Um, we, by council directing us to create not only a 10-year financial plan but to have required minimum reserves, that is how we would cushion ourselves through any kind of period of downturn. Um, certainly, the 20% is required through city ordinance, and so that money is for lack of a term, protected. And so because of those reserves, because of our 10-year financial plan, we would have a longer period of time to grow our way out of it, to make changes, et cetera, versus if we were doing a two-year or a five-year plan, that type of risk would be greater. Does that help answer that question? Okay. Mr. Fiver? Uh, real quick, Brian, the, well, it's not quick. But 68 million, you said uh, our payment would be 4.5, but your chart in the very front, there you go, shows 4.75 million. So can you explain how? Yeah, absolutely. So this chart is updated related to the financial analysis. The chart that I just came off of, 
this one should actually reflect 4.75. Okay. 4. I apologize. Okay, so it is 4.75. Yes. And then um, you mentioned in the, uh, the bottom line there, uh, specific projects. You said there's a million coming out for Ralston Road? One time. Oh, there's one a time. million a identified for Ralston Road, and that was to bridge the gap between the 15 million that we estimated the cost and any kind of right of way or acquisition that we may need to acquire. And so when we created this plan in 2015, we set aside that million dollars. It also would enable us that if um, city council wanted to move forward on a certain part of Ralston Road, but we needed to either wait for financing or wait for something else that would give us the ability to kind of design and et cetera before we receive the bond financing. Okay, and then just clarification on the use because with the examples you gave uh, just gave me a little concern. So this should be used for capital, uh, capital projects. And I think of capital projects as uh, adding, adding capacity or adding a new asset to our portfolio. Um, but when you mentioned repair or replace, I think of maintenance, and that's an operating expense, not a capital. So, Yeah, so years ago, we changed the definition on okay. what was in there, and it does allow what we call major capital maintenance. So it could allow road maintenance. Um, it could allow items like that that extend the life significantly of an asset. Another example of that would be a replacement of a park. So the actual structure in the park is allowed in here. Even though you're not creating a new park, you are creating a new playground for somebody to play on. So but city was council, the playground there before? And is it just... Re the playgrounds were not there before. They were so paid then that's for, you're adding you're mm -hmm. adding to the park. So mm -hmm. when you talk about an intersection and you're saying replacing a street light, I wouldn't I wouldn't think you'd take it out of this. It would come out of maintenance. Is that correct? I'm looking at Bob or you. It comes out of here. It it does. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have funds for both um, upgrades and rebuilds, and we have funds for new signals that mean are worn. So. Um, they're both in the capital um, budget, uh, so we just, you know, we looked at Brian and we may have to massage where those go depending on the needs. You may have a greater need for a new signal or we may have a greater need for an upgrade, so we have to make that decision as we go. Well, and maybe we can define a little bit more. Where I'm leading to is uh, uh, Mayor Williams' question about bonding for more, and I want to make sure I understand how you're using this money, the 98101 money, um, to make sure if we can increase our bonding capacity to get more of uh, 72nd done. Um, Certainly, then, if you wanted to dive into specifics under transportation, um, those dollars are used for, as Bob made reference to, new signals, signal replacement, what we call long life markers, um, uninterrupted power supplies, items like that are done out of transportation. Parks is related to replacing playgrounds, replacing playground equipment, updating those kinds of items. The fiber is directly related to building the backbone. So that's what you're looking at? Yeah, it's adding. Um, and then down to, to Council Member Miller's um, question on the specific projects, you mentioned a few in there. So are those replacing sidewalks or adding sidewalks? Or, you know, because we have some so that was a gaps. That was just identified for future conversation. So okay. at the time, by the Citizen CIP committee, it was to replace sidewalk gaps. So it was supposed to be items related to the first mile, items in and around schools, and then their priority of the sidewalks. And so as we've been going along, some of those we've been able to do either while we're redoing a road or we've had one-time funds and some of those are still there. So if you were to take funding, if council was decided to increase the amount that we would go to the voters and ask permission for, it would certainly affect that list. Okay. And could you go back to the, the dollar amount differences that we could, okay, I'm uh, just curious. So a quarter million more, we would get up to 72. Yeah, if you're really looking at adding an additional section, oh, so to second. Mayor Williams' point of yeah. let's go Oak to Sims, maybe, you're looking more at that $79 million. So we're going to have to find 750000 So, okay, three quarters. All right. All right, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Jones, <clears throat> stay on this slide. Okay. <laughs> so, um, well, I thought I, I thought I was 
you know, figuring out in my head where why you highlighted the six million. Because if you take the four point five million and the one right. and a half million, that's six million. And you got it. But then, but sixty eight plus thirty five doesn't equal eighty seven. So from a total funding or from a total principal perspective, our total principal is more than eighty seven with it the transportation be. projects and. It would be what I reflected here is only our share. So our share would be the 17 and a half. That makes sense. Okay. So, um, so then kind of backtracking then to the comment around, you know, can we bond for more of the challenges? Sure we can, but can we pay for it? Absolutely. So right now we've got a, an annual payment of 6 million under this scenario. Um, and how then do we find another million and a half Correct. to, to fund another 20 million or whatever it is, um, is the is the question I think that the mayor and Mr. Pfeiffer are asking. Yeah, and that's why I was trying to figure out if you go back to the other screen, they should be they should be side by side. Sorry, and then they are figure now. out how do you get the million uh, or whatever out of this screen here. Right. You know, because yes, we can we can come up with the other million. It just means there's certain projects they or certain hurt. kinds of uh, things that we're just not going to be able to do. Right. So, uh, and, and that's certainly a discussion that we can have with the council if you'd like us to. Mm -hmm. um, as Brian mentioned, we've set aside money for sidewalks. We've set aside money for trails. We've, we've got uh, a number of ongoing expenses uh, around traffic signals and the uninterruptible power sources and those kinds of things. And, and we're willing to look at, at any of and all of those uh, to to buy extra uh, bonding capacity to to finish more of, for example, West 72nd Avenue. But it means we'll just have to not do something else. So, it, quick question before sorry, before I forget. Um, so, if if in fact the bonding is approved, um, and we'll just use Ralston Road as an example, and um, you said that you know right now there's no active grants. But if a grant were awarded for one of those segments, how does that impact the money that we've already said is going to be bonded towards that? So we certainly have a lot of options with that. A lot depends on how we write the ballot language on how you can use those dollars. Um, the other option is you can pay off early. Many of the items don't restrict you on a time period. So you um, could use the grant money to pay the, oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly going to use Ms. Gillis earlier today. She said that would be a problem we'd love to have. Okay, no, that makes sense. Thank right. you. Ms. Ford? So I have one question on maintenance then. When, if uh, we say we did two segments of 72nd Avenue, then in terms of operations and maintenance, our operations and maintenance budget, how would that be affected um, uh, comparing what it is today and what it would be extended um, or Cer expanded? Absolutely. Certainly that's going to increase our lane miles, and so we would have to look at ways to adding dollars to our street maintenance. Um, for a period of time, it would be covered, for lack of a better word, but over time, it would definitely be... A be because it's new, it right. would be covered. But once it starts to degrade mm -hmm. somewhat, then and and now we have we have the underpass or the under portion. Oh, uh, what, we, what do you call that again? Grade separation. The grade separation. Grade separation. Um, and then you have the two trails, the walking and the bicycle trail, and then just the added lane miles. So, do we have a figure on the difference of that yet? Uh, you know, for those segments, um, the bridge is probably going to take the most work, the most maintenance. You, know, you could be looking for just the road, probably even another 3000 per year, for, uh, and then probably the same for Ralston Road. We're not talking, you know, big addition. Like Brian said, it's, it's already kind of built in there because it's new. You're probably looking at about five to ten for the bridge itself on a, annualized over a period of time uh, okay. per year. So it's not that much. It's not that much. Okay. It's adding to the inventory, obviously, but and over time it adds up. But those two pieces are not that much. Mm -hmm. This is a lively discussion. These lights are lighting up like crazy. <laughs> Ms. Miller. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Archer. I'm okay. back again on transportation. No, a um, little bit different question. So we talked once before about is it possible to do the other three segments of 72nd first? Because that's $45 million. It saves us yes. $8 million. Right now we have a thriving economy. We're paying top dollar to build these roads and 
and there will inevitably be a reset to our economy where we could take the most expensive piece and, and wait. And as the properties came up that could be impact, that will be absolutely impacted by the widening of 72nd or the grade separation, that we could purchase those properties as they became available rather than relocating somebody. So I'm just wondering if, if maybe we could consider that as an option. I just thrown it out there. Well, I think we talked about that last time, Ms. Miller, from the perspective of the, the rationale for doing the grade separation first is that that's the biggest congestion problem is when the trains come through. Um, and yes, you're gonna have greatly improved roads further west, but if you're gonna have that bottleneck, and, and I'm more concerned, frankly, from a, from a health and safety standpoint, being able to get fire trucks and ambulances through. Um, you know, they can, they can maneuver fine on the rest of 72nd Avenue now. It's when they get stopped by a train that we've got real problems. So that's why uh, I'm very sympathetic to the, to, the, to the neighbors, but the reality is that, you know, that's the section that I think needs to be done first. Mr. McGough. Mr. Archer, I think in earlier discussions, um, we had talked about a, a, a time limitation and getting started if, if the bonding were approved. Uh, is there, isn't there some kind of limitation on how soon we need to, what, how, what the deadline is for completing these projects? So there's a calculation required. If the projects go longer than three years, it's what's called an arbitrage calculation. And basically at that point, we have to compare what we've invested our bond proceeds for the return on that versus what we're paying in interest. If there's a difference in that and we're investing for more than what we're paying, we then have to return those funds. There really is no time limitation on how long a project can take, but that calculation begins at three years and then gets worse as we go. And the underpass you indicated would, would take longer than the th three Absolutely. years. Absolutely, so we're, finance is fully expecting that if the underpass is decided and it's approved and it goes through that we would have to prepare for and do that arbitrage calculation. We have to do it anyway. It's just more significant the longer it goes. And how and much of a cost might that be? To do that calculation? Um, that would depend on if we can do it internally or have to hire somebody to do it. Uh, usually if you have to hire somebody that's 30 to 50,000 to do that okay. calculation. If we can do it internally, if Lisa's still here, um, it's just her time. Okay, we'll have her stay around. She's a consultant. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Um, two questions. <clears throat> First, on the county bridge, um, not all of a sudden I'm drawing a blank on the name of that fund, but will we- Road and bridge fund. Road and bridge fund. Will that road and bridge fund from the county, will that, can that be used if in fact for long-term maintenance, if the um, cut through is done? The road and bridge funds that we receive from the county can be used for maintenance of roads. Okay. Yeah. It's not a significant amount of money I no. don't think we get, but. Especially since the commissioners don't let us have everything we're supposed to get. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to, to reflect on that, those funds have gone down significantly in the last 10 years. Do okay. you think it should go the other way, but it has not. Okay. And then, um, just a, a follow-up question from the very first conversation on the 72nd project. Um, it, I know that you've met with the property owners uh, that have gone through there. Any update or any comments that you could make with regards to those conversations? Uh, the, the property owners um, have been very courteous to, to us. They've been, um, uh, they've listened and, and I think uh, understood the uh, ramifications on each of the properties. Uh, we've reviewed that with each of them individually. Uh, and uh, certainly their concern, I think the biggest concern um, uh, is that they wanna make sure that in situations where we have to take property, and particularly if it's a full take, that we're fair and objective, um, and that um, we've talked about following the Uniform Act, and we've provided some information regarding that, um, and that um, uh, we understand and provide to them all the information going down 
uh, the, the, the process for how this would work. Um, and we keep them, uh, if council decides to go forward with this, um, with, with these projects that we keep them fully informed uh, every step of the way um, as, as uh, you know, from, from the action you would take to put it on the ballot, to if it is approved, when a, when a loan is done, when we'd need to start talking to them about uh, negotiating with, the, uh, with them on the property uh, and so forth. Okay, uh, thank you for, for taking that on prior to this discussion because I think you know, I'll, I'll speak for all of us up here. That was an important part of the conversation is for you to meet with those residents and, and have those hard conversations. So thank you for doing that. Mr. Fiver. Well, to add on that, I, I, I hope we can leverage as much options and creativity in making it work for everyone. I think we, we briefly discussed that there's some ideas out there, but it's moving around the uh, deck chairs to make it all work and hopefully we can be creative and keep everyone there as much as we can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Pfeiffer. The other thing I would add is that as we progress in the, uh, again, assuming that we go forward with this, as we progress in the finalization of the, of the construction documents, we'll have a better idea of what the impacts would be on each property. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're going with basically around 30 or so percent uh, uh, conceptual plans, and as we would progress, we would be able to have a fuller understanding of what the impacts are. Yeah, and if we can just eyes wide open and uh, transparent as well as be creative in how we can assist with, with the situation. Um, I do have a few questions still, sorry, they keep coming up, back up. Um, one discussion is, what about, have we looked at or discussed, we, I'm assuming we haven't discussed anything with the railroad. That, Not to the that, best of my knowledge. Yeah, it creates a whole other issue. Um, but have we thought about slightly elevating the tracks so we don't have to go as far down? I can and, respond to that, Mr. Fiverr. Yeah. We've learned through our work both on the BNN and a little bit of work on, on the Union Pacific that the grades on those tracks are pretty much maxed out. Okay. When we did our analysis on the BNN, we looked at several different options, and we did on this one too, but uh, where the tr uh, train went over the road, the road went over the train. Um, but it just got very costly trying to raise that elevation on the grade on the train because you have to go so far in either direction to. to and you can only have it. so much percentage, right? Correct. You have a maximum percentage of grade that those trains can travel. Okay. And, and the track through Arvada pretty much is at that max. Because it's going up the mountain. Going, yeah, right. It's, it's going, going up, up the mountain. the mountains. Correct. So, yeah, th that was a discussion around the Ward Road grade separation right. about elevating those tracks so they don't dig so much, so they don't have to take as much property. So okay. it would be. I was wondering if we just looked at that. Yeah, I'm recalling the Burlington Northern uh, track of the grade separation, and we were going as far east as L Lamar, if I remember right, to try to catch that grade and make it low enough that they could get, make it over the top of Wadsworth, and then going in the other direction, you're probably looking at car. So it's 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 long. It's expensive. Yeah, and then um, also I know that there's been an injection of grant money with the railroads on these grade separations for safety. So I'm sure we're aware of it, but we're I've, gonna, been, we're I've been hearing a lot that. of monies around that right now um, because of the railroads encouraging this type of activity. Right. Right. Um, and then the last thing I didn't catch where you were showing the pool payments. I mean, how were you thinking we were paying for that? It was it just out of the general fund. No, or? the pool payments would also have to come out. Uh, are being proposed to coming out of this uh, the, pr the special yes. or the specific pro projects line Cor correct Is and that? possibly looking at all the other lines to see if there's anything in those that we could adjust so really the 2.9 3.3 year over year that 1.5 of that's for the pool so we're, we're already impacting those projects. Yes. Uh, the only other thing I would add is, is if we were able to do the vendor fee, that would offset. Oh, uh, yeah. You would have an injection estimate. of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because I just want to make sure we were clear that we were already eroding away those projects with the pool in here. Correct. And I didn't hear that come out. Th that is correct. Okay. And then the last question, and I'll leave it to be, is the I'll bat. believe that when I see it. <laughs> All right. I keep pushing my button. Um, the, the ballot. Um, I'm assuming if the ballot passes for the point, what is it, 625? I can't remember, 6.62. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, increase, uh, we'll have a backfill. I don't know what the number is for us, but I'm assuming we'll get Pretty some big. money out of that. Uh, yes, I, I can I can answer that question based on the inf information I have now. Um, I think the number, uh, if that ballot measure was to pass, would be about four and a half million the first year, and then about six six point four uh, for years uh, following that. So if that was to pass, I think we would be able to have a conversation with the city council about. Uh, how to uh, what we would like to do in terms of allocating those funds, whether we'd like to allocate them towards some specific projects, perhaps to backfill what has been taken out here, or whether we would want to put uh, some of it towards street maintenance. Um, you know, I think we would that would you know to paraphrase what uh, what Brian said earlier about a statement Lori made. That would be another nice problem to have. And there's no restrictions on that. If that passes, we could use it for capital or, or maintenance, just as long as it's transportation, transportation related. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Mr. Marriott. Uh, thank you. I was going to comment just on one quick thing, and that's we've brought up the vendor fee um, as, as, a part, as a potential way of, of shuffling some funding around. Um, as, as a retailer, um, we have through the years had a vendor fee and sometimes not had a vendor fee currently don't have a vendor fee and um, I think the logic of of removing that vendor fee is probably okay in today's world we operate so differently than we used to um, and uh, figuring and remitting our sales tax is a, is a very very small piece of of what we do administratively these days to, to, to make our business work and the vendor fee while nobody would ever turn down money it, it's such a it's such a token such a small amount i mean it's not like you can hire an accounting firm to do your sales tax for you for what the vendor fee right. gave you um and so uh, uh you know as much as i would as much as it's way against my nature to ever say that <laughs> i think the, uh what did you do with john mary i, I think yeah <laughs> and who are you i think the uh the, the 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 logic of potentially removing the vendor fee i think is okay and 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 i think e even you know my business is a little bit bigger than a real small business these days but even for a real small business the the tools that the city has put in place to allow uh an easy way of figuring and remitting sales tax has made it much less of a burdensome project process than it was in the 1970s or 80s or 90s. So, um, I, you know, for me, I would be okay with that. I think that's Thank you. Uh, probably time that we do that, whether it's for this or or, or not. I mean, or for something. For else. something else. But uh, okay. Thank you, Ms. Ford. I <laughs> you said that. Um, I have a question on the, I just want to clarify on the Myers Pool. So um, what year was the Myers Pool originally built? 1979 or 1980. Okay. And um, when it was built, it was built for 40 years, is that right? It, it was built to last for 40 years? Y you or? know, Council Member Ford, I'm, I'm not sure that, that back at that time that anyone really did a calculation like that. I, I believe they built it to last a long time. Um, unfortunately, the glue lamb construction, um, you know, wooden structure with, with uh, you know, steel uh, braces and all those kinds of things. I'm not sure if people understood that uh, a long time with that type of structure with uh, the moisture and humidity generated by an indoor pool, uh, was was understood to la would, would, was understood at that point to last for a very long time. So so my question is is um, if we were to build a new Myers pool, what length of time would it be built for? And then do we put and or where would we put the cost of replacing it at that point in terms of saving money so that we have it at that point so we don't get to a point in the future where you know we have to re replace another pool and we don't have the money at that point we have to kind of look for additional funding right. at that point so h how is that done and do we do that i mean this is an area of concern for me especially when we look at our parks and 
anytime we build something, do we include in the cost of building that project what it's going to cost to not only maintain it, but then to replace, uh, which I guess is, is in, a, in a sense maintenance, but it's still, we're looking at an overall cost here of replacing. So how does that get done in terms of budgeting? Well, I would, I would, I would offer first uh, that that's something that we would need to uh, negotiate, I think, between Apex and uh, the city and uh, the school district uh, through the IGA. But uh, quite simply, we would be looking at all the building components, so um, all the all the HVAC, uh, the filtration system, all those kinds of things. We would need to factor in a cost for the ongoing maintenance and replacement of those kinds of, of, of structures. And then we need to look at the building itself mm -hmm. and, and, and factor in what the, uh, what the cost to replace the building based on the life expectancy of the building. One of the things that we did when we uh, identified the 35 mil million for this uh, project cost was to look at a uh, basically a 50 year building with a block wall and, and, and the kinds of construction material that have proven over time to last uh, significantly longer than what's been con what's constructed there now. So we would need to look at, at basically a factor of uh, somewhere around 50 years and then the, the, the factor to replace the building. It will probably require us to uh, look at our uh, priorities and put away you know, a significant amount of money each year to make sure that at the end of 50 years we have the money available to replace that pool. So that would be a challenge we would need to take on um, as we negotiate the IGA and, and look at the allocation of future resources. Okay. It would not be forgotten, let me put it that way. Well, and we do that now with the uh, taking lasting Cor care. Correct. I mean, Correct. that's in reserve yeah. for depreciation. Right. We do, I mean, that's right. That's smart. part of what we do. Right. And I do want to point out, Councilmember Ford, anytime we have a new project that is proposed, we require an operating line item to be created, and it is part of our funding package. Okay. And that includes so, the replacement, the operating? Sometimes it includes replacement, sometimes it does not. But certainly all the equipment includes replacement, all the operating items include replacement. Buildings, in some cases it does, in some cases it does not. Okay. Thank you. Right. And one thing we haven't factored into any of this discussion is the recent Supreme Court decision, which is going to generate more sales tax force. So, you know, we're going to have some additional funds from that, regardless of the election this, this fall. Um, you know, so we, of course, we don't know what those numbers are going to be for quite some time. Right. Timing on that is still to be determined. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it seems to me that we need to, at some juncture, make a decision. Do we want to move forward with these two as separate projects? Yes. And yeah. do we want to look at possibly funding another segment of 72nd Avenue um, as to whether or not that makes sense mm -hmm. at this time or, or not? And, and getting you know, a final decision on which segments do we do first? Right. Um, so. Uh, if we work back from from uh, you know the the final decision point, uh, the uh, decision to place an item on the ballot uh, would need to occur on August the 20th, which is our second business meeting in in August, uh, unless we schedule a special meeting. Uh, that's that's certainly always an option for the council, but but uh, not. Assuming that we don't, then August 20th is when we would need to actually take an action to uh, place uh, something on the ballot. Um, we can certainly come back to you uh, at a future workshop uh, uh, coming up in uh, at the actually even at the end of this month if if if, um, if timing works or beginning in August uh, for additional discussion discussion around the CIP uh, around, around perhaps which projects we would recommend to you uh, that uh, that we uh, reduce funding from to see if there's some additional funding that we can identify for. Um, uh, you know, for the uh, uh, for completing uh, additional segments of West 72nd Avenue, and certainly we would need to uh, make sure the council is in agreement with starting uh, on West 72nd Avenue where where we're proposing to start. We we do see that I think from a staff standpoint, an engineering standpoint, we do see the the greatest uh, need in terms of alleviating traffic on West 72nd Avenue to be that grade separation um, uh, 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 for the railroad. Mr. Marriott? 
Yeah, so I, I'd like to weigh in on that. I, I think if we can possibly do 72nd to Sims, I just think that it seems like such a natural because if we're going to go to Oak and do that intersection and then try to taper out then, I mean, the equipment's on site, the, the process for acquiring right away that, you know, just every, every component that it takes to do that, um, you know, it, it kind of completes a real segment. So I think if, if there's any way we can look hard at that about how we do it, and maybe we do it creatively, you know, I'm reminded that in last year's one-time funding request, we put $3 million into our reserves, and, and that's a third of the cost of catching that last section to get to Sims. And I think uh, whether it's a, a, a collection of, of means of funding that or whether it's an addition to this or, or, or whatever, I, I agree with the mayor. I think that, I think that if, it, it's such a big lift, such a big mobilization to do the grade separation and to do from Kipling westbound, it just seems like such a shame to be stopping at Oak unless, you abs unless there's absolutely no way that it seems like that's a place to, to step forward and step maybe just to push a little bit harder just to get that completed all the way to that next major intersection. So I would, I would be thinking that's a better way to go. I would agree with that personally. I would like to see if we can do it to do both segments of 72nd to Sim. Sims, okay. Sim, right, yeah. And, and, and that would then include the two sections in, for Ralston. Right. And, um, and you think there's a possibility that we can do the two sections on Sims, the t you know, the Ralston, the two sections for Ralston and the Meyer, mm -hmm. Myers pool? Yeah, I think we can bring financing options to the council to make that happen. Mr. McGough. Sure. Yes, I'd like to consider that uh, option uh, no later than the August 20 meeting. To take a look at that additional segment of 70 seconds. Okay. Mr. Pfeiffer. Yeah, Sims to, to Kipling's good with me as well. And then, um, uh, yeah, I'm good with uh, all that. And I, I think sooner than later, okay. early August would be nice. Yeah. Need more time. Mr. Jones. Yeah, I'm good with what's been proposed and discussed. And I would agree if we could see this sooner than August 20th. Okay. Ms. Miller? Okay. Reluctantly, I know, because it, and I understand why, and it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, we've, we've had to displace people before. My justification is, is if it's for road projects to deal with serious congestion issues and public safety issues, it's very different discussion than where you're condemning somebody's property to give it to somebody else to develop for, you know, private purposes. So. I mean, this is truly public purpose, so. Just um, to complete the loop, um, one of the questions that council had asked prior was, if we cash financed, where would we be? And I just wanted to reflect, assuming these three projects and we use the $6 million number that we've been talking about, not the increased now that council just proposed, we would be at about 134 million. And if you remember from that prior slide, the total is 119 million if we do some sort of financing mechanism. So it still makes sense at this point to issue debt, do a COP, do a bank loan, something to that extent. And your number here includes uh, the increases to material and so forth. Absolutely. So to when you say 2041 Myers pool, our 17.5 is actually now 36 million. That is correct. That would be our share. Our Thank share. you for pointing so, that out. Yes. So in 2024 or 2041, it would cost us $72 million to replace a $35, $35 million pool. Again, yes, using yeah. all those averages and historic increases. And I'm reluctant to go to the last slide, but. <laughs> I think you've already heard what's on our mind. Okay, very good. Okay, we'll take a recess, go upstairs um, for some additional discussion, I think with our judge and, and to get some computer skills taught to us. And then we'll be back down at um, continue workshops at 6.
Very good. We're reconvened uh, from our four o'clock session. I'll note for the record that uh, Mr. McGough uh, is not going to be with us the rest of the evening. He had previously advised us of that. Since he was here earlier, I don't think we need to formally excuse him because he was here for a portion of the meeting. Uh, we've got uh, two workshops that we're going to proceed with. Mr. Devin. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. The first item is uh, an update from Denver Water. We have our guests and partners from Denver Water here, and I'll start with introducing Melissa Brassfield. All right. Good evening. Thanks for coming out. Of course, anytime. Um, I am Melissa Brassfield. I am the communications coordinator for the Gross Reservoir Expansion Project. Um, familiar faces to most of you. We were here a few months ago to update you guys, so just to give you guys a couple little updates and recaps um, on the North System Renewal and Gross Reservoir. Uh, so Gross Reservoir is the first portion um, of the North System Renewal, so you guys are all familiar um, with that project. It's about $420 million worth of infrastructure improvements at Gross Reservoir. Uh, the North System Renewal project continues on from there, starting at Ralston um, with the treatment plant and the replacement of conduits. Uh, Katie Knoll, um, who will be, who's also with Denver Water here, will be talking more about that project. Um, in total, these projects um, equal up over $1 billion of capital improvements that Denver Water is undertaking at the moment. So this is um, a newer graphic than what you guys may have seen at the last meeting that we presented to. So this um, is basically all of Denver Water's collection system um, split into the north and south end, as well as all of Denver Water's distributors, as well as their direct customers. Um, so that includes you guys with Arvada, um, and all of your customers and, and community members are included in that map. Uh, so this is just sort of the facts and numbers um, of the project. Uh, currently, the dam sits at 340 feet. Uh, we'll be raising that 131 feet, so the final height will be 471 feet, one big milestone. That will be the tallest dam in Colorado upon completion. Um, and that will nearly triple the capacity of the current reservoir, so that'll equal about 119,000 acre feet. So this uh, infographic, or graphic is one that you guys have maybe seen in the past. Um, it's also in the packet that you guys have at your desks. Um, one thing that I'll point out um, that we're already working on is that bottom second from the left image, uh, learning by doing. So that picture is actually an updated picture post uh, renovations and remediations that happened on the Fraser River in, in uh, <coughs> excuse me, up by Fraser area. Um, so that's just a big project that we're working on in collaboration with Learning by Doing Cooperative um, Organization. So that's just something to highlight in that over $20 million of uh, mitigation and enhancements. Uh, this is also a newer rendering or graphic that you guys may not have seen in the last presentation. So this is the most up-to-date rendering of what the new dam will look like. Um, similar uh, look and, and feel of, of the current dam, the biggest differences are those two what are called thrust blocks um, on the side, so that's taking the load off, um, making the, the dam in the middle pretty much almost the same thickness as it currently is. Uh, so just to give you guys an overview and an idea of what the finished project will look like. Um, so, like I said, there's um, a couple things that are going on uh, at Gross Reservoir. So this is uh, one, a uh, couple pictures and a, and a graphic for you guys of some activities that are going on on site over the last month and will continue in until about September timeframe. Um, so this is all subsurface investigation, um, geotechnical drilling, geophysical work uh, that is needed for the design of the dam. Uh, so these are a couple pictures. The one on the uh, right side is um, we had a couple folks uh, basically hanging off of ropes off the side of the um, abutment area, and they were basically um, getting additional data on what that foundation looks like. And then that bottom picture is a picture of the drill rig um, just about two weeks ago up on site. Uh, so you guys are probably interested in what's coming up next. Um, so we are still kind of hold, in a holding pattern, waiting for FERC to make their final decision on our license amendment. Uh, that could come really at any day now. Uh, we're prepared and ready and, and you know, eager to obtain that, as I'm sure you guys are, to kind of move this project forward. Uh, moving into 2019, we'll be continuing and finishing up that final dam design uh, and then working on site development. Uh, that continues uh, basically into construction, which is slated for about 2021. Uh, project completion is still on track for 2025. 
Uh, so no major changes or updates to that. We're just kind of at the mercy of FERC and their <laughs> approval status. Sort of like us with the FRA and the G line. So <laughs> we, we unfortunately know how the federal government works. How, yep. does, how does potential litigation affect these time schedules? There is potential for delay. Um, mostly that, that potential is going to hit us next year um, as far as any issues that we run into with Boulder County and getting that approvals. Um, we have included that into our scheduling. Um, so we have a little bit of flex room um, that we've built in in order to hit, con con continue that 2025 deadline. So it's anticipated, um, but what that process exactly looks like or how long it takes, not entirely sure but it is planned into our schedule. Good, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the last piece that I'll kind of chat about um, is our uh, communications and community outreach component. Um, so this is where I spend about three days of my week is up at our yurt. I know I, some of you guys have been up there on the tour that we did last year. Um, so we host office hours of between five and six days a week. Um, we have seen just this year alone since we've been open in April, we've seen over 250 people in the yurt already. Um, we also host um, tours up there as well as we've been doing community presentations similar to this to different community groups, Kiwanis, Rotary is all throughout the metro area. In those two efforts, we've hit over 300 people. Um, in, in outreach efforts. So combined, that's over 500, almost 600 people that we've touched and given information to on this project, which is um, really important for us to get the information out there. Um, and we will continue to do that and will likely continue to see those really positive trends and numbers. Um, so that is all that I have on Gross Reservoir. I can take any more questions you guys have. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to Katie Knoll and she can inform you guys a little bit more about the rest of the North System. Any other questions on the reservoir? Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Biber. 500 people, that's all you've reached in, since when? S just this year. Since January 1? Yeah. Probably need more than 500 people. Well. <laughs> what? At the yurt. No, and the Kiwanis, and that's all combined. At it's the about, yurt. Yeah, it's about 250 from the yurt, and then about 300 people. Those community presentations, we do about two a month is what sort of our goal is. Um, and that's been pretty much on, on pace. We've been making those presentations. Um, it's definitely something we continue to do. Uh, and 500 or, or anything like that is definitely not a, our goal and we're gonna stop. We're gonna continue doing okay. that outreach. Okay. okay, those of us who went on the tour, it was very informative and it was a great opportunity to really, and, and frankly, to walk out on that dam is quite the experience. Yeah, definitely great. is. Okay, very, thank you. very good. I'm always the tallest one of these things. Um, hi, uh, thanks for having us back. I'm Katie Knoll, I'm the Community Relations Manager for Denver Water, and I am responsible for the communications on everything on that list below Gross Reservoir. So I'll walk you through um, some of the updates that we have on that project. Uh, this map I showed you guys the last time, um, it just kind of gives a high level overview of the projects that we're gonna be taking on in the North System. That's the up on the upper left-hand corner there is the North Water Treatment Plant that we're building on the, our Ralston property just west of Highway 93. Uh, we're replacing um, a water pipeline that runs eight and a half miles from Ralston um, to our Moffett distribution site right now. Um, and then we're gonna be doing some upgrades on the Moffett distribution site or the Moffett treatment plant site to accommodate that pipeline. So those are just, it's basically three different projects kind of running there. Um, total that's going to be for this part of it is going to be about six hundred million dollars in capital investment over the next five to six years. And this one I showed you guys last time too. I just want to it's just another perspective and it kind of shows um, the jurisdictions that we're going to be impacting. So again, starting up at the left top left there is Ralston Reservoir and the treatment plant. You'll see that you, uh, the city of Arvada, is uh, just directly impacted only in that little piece up there at the top. And I do have some updates I'll get to on that. Um, and then mostly we're running through Jefferson County and we're working with North Table uh, Mountain Water and Sanitation District on this project as well. Where it really gets impactful is right there at I-70, um, the Applewood Village uh, Shopping District and past there, the houses get really tight in there. We're gonna be impacting a lot of people as we move through Wheat Ridge and then into Lakewood where the treatment plan is. Um, we are working really closely with you guys on this project, and I understand we're also uh, currently working with you to hook up water and sewer facilities for the construction site um, and for the uh, treatment plan in general. So we really appreciate that. 
Um, I'm going to start with the North Water Pipeline because that's the one that's the most visual and has the most impacts at the moment. Um, and like I said, we're replacing actually one of two pipelines that run through there. Um, the pipeline we're replacing will carry the treated water from North Water Treatment Plant down to the Moffett facility to, be, um, to go into our distribution system at that site. Um, there will still be another conduit that runs down there carrying raw water to Moffett so that we can still um, use that pipeline to treat water at Moffett if we need it. Um, we started last year on this project with just some of the tunneling work. I think I mentioned that when I was here last, uh, last time in December. We, um, did that, we started that in the fall, and that will run through the end of this year. And I have a little um, tunnel graphic update that I can uh, show you there. But you can see uh, the, one, the picture on the right there is our site at I-70, which probably most people is the most visual one there by Applewood. And then the one on the left is when we were crossing 44th Avenue recently. Um, that's kind of, you can kind of get some perspective for how big that pipe is. Um, so tunnels, just I'm going to give you a quick run through on this because none of them are actually in Arvada, but I want to stop, uh, start up there on the top right there with the tunnel that we need, that we were going to dig underneath Highway 93. I wanted to let you know there is an update on that. We are now going to be open cutting that across Highway 93. So we have been permitted by CDOT to do that. We will be keeping uh, traffic open in both directions while we do that, but there will be lane shifts to accommodate the work zone. Um, and I haven't confirmed this, but I personally will be pushing for us to have some vari variable message boards up so that we can let commuters know that's coming and what the timeline is going to be on that. Um, we're aiming to do that, I think, sometime this fall. But since we just got the permit, I don't have a lot more specifics at this point. Why the change on that? Um, I think cost, actually. CDOT was going to let us do it, and I think it's a little bit cheaper to just open cut through there. Um, let's see, just running really quickly through the rest of them. The rest of them are kind of clustered around that I-70, Highway 58 area. Tunnels 2 and 3 are going to be going under some BNSF uh, rail, rail lines, um, so we've been working with them on permits. Um, number 4 is Highway 58. You may have seen that. It's just south of Highway 58. Uh, the tunnel on that is almost done, so we're going to be ready to start running the pipe through there, and we should be done with that um, by the end of this summer. Then number five is I-70. That tunnel is under Applewood Village shopping, dis or shopping area right now. It's almost, it's probably about two-thirds of the way underneath there. Um, and we will be popping up to do some open cut work in the southeast corner. If any of you visit that shopping center, it's um, kind of near the Chipotle. We'll have to block off some spots sort of in the corner by that Chipotle, but it shouldn't impact the business of Applewood too much. And we'll be out of there by November to make sure that Applejack is not impacted in any way during please, the holiday season. Please. <laughs> um, and then just number six and seven on there, just FYI, we did cut across Clear Creek with an open cut, and that went through really with very little complication. Um, and then we crossed 44th Avenue um, with an open cut, and we had to close 44th Avenue for two weeks to do that, and, and that actually went pretty well. So, um, so far the tunnels, phase of this is going well. Can I ask a question about that? Just sure. Just edification. So you're tunneling underneath the shopping center, yeah. the little machines tunneling, and you're pulling a pipe underneath it. And do you have to backfill that? or? The ton as I understand it, the they're doing the tunnel right now. There's no pipe in there yet. So they'll string the pipe in once the tunnel's already Is it the complete. exact same size as the pipe? or? I'm just curious if it sinks, you know, if the shopping center sinks or, you know, you do this in your house and it drops three feet, you know. Well, as the public affairs representative, I can't really get into too much detail on the engineering, but I can oh, find okay. out that just, answer for just, you. Just, sorry, just curiosity. No, no I understand. It's, ama it's amazing engineering effort. That's why I'm just curious. Yeah, it is pretty exciting to just, it's kind of cool. And we do tours out there. If you guys are ever interested, we can show you around a little bit at that tunnel site. It's kind of interesting, but I can find out more detail on that for you. Um, and then the North Water Pipeline, this I think would probably be the most interesting to you, particularly Councilman Jones, I believe this is your district. Um, I took a little ride up there actually before I came just to make sure I knew what was going on. And it does look like we cleared quite a bit of the site up there in preparation for this pipeline to come through. So the tentative schedule on that, and again, that's really subject to change, but what they're planning to do is do the street crossing up there at 64th Avenue um, in the next like month or so. And then they're going to go back onto the Arvada treatment plant property and do a lot of the work there. So there'll be very little public impact, but we'll be working closely with Jim and his staff on that. Then they'll do the 60th Avenue crossing down there on the south side of the park um, in sort of the October, November timeframe. And then right now they're planning to, once they do the 60th crossing, then work south to north up across the park. 
So we're hoping to do a lot of that park work in the winter, so hopefully it won't be too impactful to recreationalists out there. Good news, I noticed you guys are doing a lot of work out there anyway, so I think we're just kind of blending into what's happening now. But I've been talking with Maria and your parks department about it, and I'm hoping to get some signage and stuff out there so people know what's happening and they know, you know, kind of the areas where they're being blocked off and why, so. When did you say you were doing the 64th? I think in the next month or so. Okay. We, um, we're just starting to have construction meetings. Garney is actually our contractor for this project and they are also working with you guys on infrastructure relocation on your site. So the coordination should be pretty good since we're all using the same contractor. Okay. Then now moving on to the treatment plant, there's a little bit of um, update on that. We've been kind of going back and forth on the treatment plant design for a while now. Um, we want to just make sure that we're building what we need and the, what we need serves the capacity in that north system. So where we landed is we are now building a 75 MGD per day treatment plant. It was 150 when I came to talk to you in December. But we're, what we decided was we were going to build the 75 MGD and then make it expandable to 150 MGD in the future as we need it. Um, Moffitt will also be um, operational, will remain operational. That's why that conduit will still bring raw water down to Moffitt. Um, that'll be at only at about a 60 MGD capacity and kind of just as needed on that water. The bulk of it will be treated up at North Water and then run through the new pipeline. Um, this is going to be a excuse me, $520 million investment on this treatment plant. We just took it to our board last week and got approval to proceed, so we are going to be moving forward on it now. Um, just some highlights that I mentioned before. It's going to have upgraded treatment capacity, so we're going to be having, we have UV dis disinfection in there, which is a lot better at, c at catching contaminants, particularly and if any unexpected incidents happen, we have that treatment, that elevated treatment capacity available to us. We're going to be using chlorine bleach on the site instead of chlorine gas, which is much safer to transport, so we're excited about that. We're adding hydropower to the site. Um, and again, during the design process, we really made sure that we were designing it so it used the minimal amount of CO2, energy, um, water. We really wanted to just, really just using our own tagline, build what we need. So um, you will be seeing some work start on the site here in the fall. It'll just be some site work mostly. We're gonna be moving our job site trailers out there. We're gonna be doing some pipe relocation on the site, and then we're gonna be building our access road and paving that. So you're gonna see that pretty much, that's, that's about all you'd see um, coming up this fall. We are hoping to get uh, finished with design, I think by next summer, so. Uh, I just like to show this graphic for your information. Um, I know, we're, we've been really conscious of the visual impact because this has, you know, previously has had nothing, it's nothing on it. So this is the view looking from, if you were driving north to south on Highway 93, this is kind of what you would see, and it doesn't look like much, and that's kind of the intent. We're trying to use um, paint colors to kind of blend into the, um, to the landscape. We've buried a lot of the buildings, which helps us out with our HVAC costs, but also helps out with the visual impacts because they're kind of buried there, and there's, a, there's some hills kind of on the front side of that property that kind of block that view. Um, and then just, again, reminder that uh, we did a traffic study here. This road gets about 17,000 and 24,000 cars per day. We'll be adding about 1,400 to that mix during construction, and then only about 60 to that mix um, once the plant's operational. And the plant's intended to be largely um, automated, so we're expecting to have less staff on that site. Um, and this, uh, we just like we're doing with Gross, um, we are also trying to get out and we really are committed to being a good neighbor on this project. Um, obviously, safety is going to be our number one priority, but we're really working to minimize impacts to people, particularly from the pipeline. As we move through, we'll never be able to eliminate everything, but we're going to do the best we can on noise, dust, traffic. The best way we can really help people cope is to communicate with them, so we're really trying to step up those efforts now that construction is starting. That um, picture you see up there is actually me at an outreach event we had for the 44th Avenue crossing, we had that in that community so that they could kind of come and talk to us about that road being closed and the project that's going to be running through there. We also did a blog post story about that particular crossing um, where we interviewed the homeowner who was impacted and we kind of put that together so that neighbors that are going to be impacted down the road can kind of get a little bit of perspective about what's coming, see the size of the pipe, hear from somebody that's been through it. And we think that we did a pretty good job. He was pretty happy with our restoration. So we're hoping that can help people kind of get a little bit more comfortable with it as it, come, as it gets closer. Oh, 
And I'm also working with Maria and all the PIOs in this area to make sure I send them at least quarterly updates on what's going on. We're trying to use your communication channels to get the word out as well. Um, and then I'm working with Arvada Parks, hopefully, on some of that signage for the current West Phase part. And then last, um, since I'm last, I just plug my website because it has a really cool map that you can zoom in and see all the infrastructure. And I have little boxes in there that can give you updates on what's going on at that particular site at any time. So we have that and we have all the information that's in your packet and that I've talked to you about today is all up there on the website for people. So that's kind of it for today. Does anybody have any questions? I, I guess my only question would be, is there anything you need help from us on on the permitting process to keep the heat on or just do you think it's moving? Oh, for Gross Reservoir? Right. Yeah, because we're, I think, all, yeah, we're good on the North System stuff with permits. But right. I think, do we need anything else from our vet at this point? I think we've received a bunch of letters from, of support from you on, in every permitting process, so we appreciate that. Yeah, we'll definitely be in communication if we ever do. Good. All right, Very thanks. good. Thank you all for your presentation. Keep moving forward on it. It's, uh, it's a very important project to us, obviously, particularly Gross Reservoir from um, you know, our assurance to our citizens that with that facility we can uh, safely take care of our citizens' need for full build out of the city. So we're thrilled to be in partnership with you. All right. Very good. Have a good evening. Thanks. Mr. Devin. Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, the next presentation, uh, I believe, will start off with uh, Jessica Prosser, uh, who will present on community engagement, visioning, and strategic planning update. She's got a team of uh, folks that are with her, uh, including people from the community, and I'll let her take it from there. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Good evening, Mayor and members of council. We are here to talk about our community visioning process which we are calling Speak Up Arvada. And this process is really um, intended to augment council strategic planning effort that they will, um, we're starting now essentially, and then council will be setting their new strategic plan in early 2019. And then it's also intended to build upon a lot of our existing community engagement strategies that we already have from neighboring, district policing, um, and all of our different uh, programs that we have. So, the project scope, um, since the last time you got an update on this, has changed slightly, but I think the intent is still there that we really want to engage the community. We want to dig deeper with our citizen survey results that we got. Um, we want to establish a vision that resonates with city council, um, that makes sense for today and really points us towards the future. Um, we want to establish an ongoing engagement strategy um, with a constant feedback loop system um, that's more robust than what we have today. We want to reach those populations that we don't always hear from and engage with and really see Arvada through the community's eyes. So this graphic really is something that we're working on to make sense for our staff and for council in terms of what the strategic planning process looks like from a little broader perspective. So up there at the kind of 40,000 and 30,000 foot level, you see the visioning statements, those long range plans that we create and shows that really in those blue and white slider bars that council's heavily involved in this piece of the puzzle. Um, this is where you all set the vision and set some of those frameworks, set your strategic plans for us to then take um, and implement as a staff down to the department and sort of work system levels. So this is, this is just kind of to put it, this visioning process into the larger context of what the strategic planning process will look like. So in terms of the project approach, um, one of the things that um, we felt was kind of lacking in the previous sort of approach to this was an online engagement piece that would help us reach more individuals. Um, we wanted to go further than just a few community meetings where we would interface with folks face to face and you know maybe get a couple hundred folks, but we wanted to really make this more robust. So we've decided to use um, the Bang the Table software, which is really called also Engagement HQ. And I wanted to read their, um, their sort of philosophy. It's training the community to see the opportunity, focusing people on what they want to see, 
The solutions will come from that. The nature of the tools can be used to direct people towards the positive. And so when I've listened to the folks that run Bang the Table, you know, it really came out of the loudest person in the room that's banging the table is the voice that's heard. And we don't want that to be the case with this. And this software really helps you to hear from everyone at any time of the day, anywhere they can engage with you. What's the other name for it? Engagement HQ. That's their sort of software company name. Okay. And so they use. Um, so it almost, it almost sounds like it's promoting banging the table. Right, right. But it's really not. So, so the, maybe uh, we should use the other name. <laughs> yeah, which, which we can. Um, so many of our surrounding peer jurisdictions use this software. There's Be Heard Boulder, Guiding Golden, Imagine Lakewood. Um, across the country, folks are using this. Let's Talk Parker. Parker just launched theirs a few months ago. Um, so it's really been proven to be a best practice in being able to engage folks. And we're going to dive into the site in a minute and really look around and show how it's different than a social media sort of traditional site. Um, we're also going to use our existing neighborhood leader network to get out there and spread the word about communicating and providing feedback. We've taken all of our existing uh, long range plans, our comp plan, our bike ped master plan, our parks master plan, the arts master plan that we just did, and we unpacked all those visioning statements. They all have a vision statement and they have a lot of commonalities in them. So we wanted to use that as a platform for some of the themes that we're gonna use in this. Then we also looked at our citizen survey and looked at some of those key drivers, those things that are high importance, um, to the community where it said in our citizen survey, if you <clears throat> increase sort of the satisfaction level with some of these things, that's where you're gonna get you know, higher importance. Um, and then we've also looked at our existing strategic council plans as well as our departmental priorities and, and different things there. And then lastly, um, the, the real key to this that we think that's gonna make this project a success is using community connectors. And this is something that we did with our Healthy Places initiative. Um, and so that was successful where we hired folks that lived in the neighborhood to engage the neighborhood. So we put out a call on Nextdoor um, and through our existing communication channels um, about a month ago um, for folks to be community connectors. Um, there'll be temporary folks working. We got about 30 applications. We interviewed, I think, 14 of the folks and we've landed on eight. Um, and we wanted to have a good cross representation across the community. So we've got folks from all different neighborhoods, east to west, different ages and demographics to help us with this. And we wanted to leverage their networks um, to meet people where they're already gathered and ask people these questions. We know that not everyone in the community is gonna engage with us through the Speak Up Arvada site. And so these folks will be able to do some paper surveying and talk to folks out in the community um, and provide that input into the site, but have a face-to-face -face conversation with folks. So what I'd like to do, six of the eight of them were able to make it tonight, which is fabulous. And so I wanted to ask each of them to come up, give us, you know, just introduce themselves, tell us what neighborhood they live in and what they love about Arvada. That's one of the key questions we're gonna be asking in some different forms that you'll see. So why don't each of you come up and introduce yourself, and then we will continue our presentation from there. Go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Heidi Bush. I live in Allendale. I'm a stay-at-home parent. Uh, I have two little girls, and I love all the playgrounds in Arvada. Uh, my girls and I were on a mission in the fall to go to a new one every day, <laughs> and we still have not um, managed to find all of them, but we will. All right, welcome. Good evening, my name is Richie Averill and I am a proud resident of the Homestead Park neighborhood in Lamar Heights. And what I really like about Arvada is the sense of community. I've lived in several states, uh, traveled across the country, and this is the one place that actually feels like home. So that's my favorite thing about Arvada. Okay. Hi, I'm Don Scott and I'm from the Club Crest community area. Um, and but the thing I like most, I guess, about Arvada is being a member of the Silver Sneakers generation. <laughs> uh, I love the trails. I love all of the parks you've given to us and very uh, diligently work to get us those within a half a mile of each other. And the recreation centers, and it's just wonderful for me um, to stay healthy and to be healthy. Great.
My name is Charlie Alt. Uh, I, uh, along with Donna, have lived uh, in the Arvada area since uh, 1966. Started out in the Hutchison subdivision and I'm now in the Alta Vista subdivision. And we moved out here from Denver because our kids were growing up and we wanted them to be a part of the school system of the public school system in Arvada. And, and beyond that, that blossomed into the people that are here. The diversity of the people, um, the kindness of the people, the safety of the people, uh, make it a wonderful community to be a part of. So that's my story. Great. And Charlie's going to be hosting a great party for National Night Out. Yeah, on the 7th of uh, August. Yeah. That's right. Um, this is a little high for me. Um, my name is Brittany Coffey, and I live in the Majestic View slash Scenic Heights neighborhood. I'm a stay-at-home mom, and um, we've been in Arvada for about seven years, and I think the thing that I love the most is despite it growing population, it still feels like a small town to me. And um, I think I'll piggyback on what somebody else said, um, the sense of community with regards to that. So. We always joke that Arvada is uh, Mayberry on steroids. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name's Mark Hartman. I've been here since 1960, born and raised. I raised my family here. Um, one of the gentlemen talked about it being home. It is home, um, but I love the vision. You guys can see the past, but still see the future. And, th and that's optimistic and hopeful. So thank you. Thank you. Super. So we're really excited about this group to get them connected and um, unleash them out in the community to hear the voices of the community. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Carice, um, and her and Anessa are going to uh, preview our um, engagement site, speakup.arvada.org. I'm also very short. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. So as Jessica mentioned, staff was very intentional in selecting these project themes that we'd cover throughout the entire visioning process. And so we wanted to use a combination of different tools to really flesh out these themes and get the best possible feedback from our community. Um, and the structure of the site as we'll show you in just a moment, truly encourages positive, constructive feedback. And so throughout this whole process, we'll be covering a wide variety of different topics. As you can see on your screen, the themes that we've developed range from development and housing to Arvada stories and visions. So we're really excited to dive deeper into these topics. And we know that this platform will be extremely effective in letting us evolve these themes over time as we're hearing feedback from our customers. You know, the feedback that we do receive will be both qualitative and quantitative. <clears throat> so it'll give us a solid picture of what our residents feel about their community. And we also know that we'll be able to use this bang the table platform to do ongoing engagement. Um, and so, especially when the city wants to solicit feedback on any hot topics or future projects, we'll be able to use this site to do so. So I do want to show you a little bit about how we're going to promote this process. Uh, so we'll use all of our regular communication channels, such as the Arvada Report, Arvada News, social media, um, and as you can see on your screen, we'll be capturing the regular traffic that go to our arvada.org website. Um, so you can see the green button is a direct link to the Speak Up Arvada site. So we'll be able to reach people that way. Um, we'll also be having our community connectors go out into the community, really use those networks that they have and reach populations that 
we may not have heard from in the past. So we do want to give you a quick tour of the site. Uh, just to show you a few of the tools that we'll be using and give you a sense of what our residents will experience when they're on this site. So this is our homepage. And you can see in the top left corner, we've branded it with the Speak Up Arvada logo. Um, and then if you look throughout the rest of the site, we have several different project tiles. For this first phase of engagement, we have five tiles. Uh, and we'll preview a few of those. Uh, you can also see on the right side key dates that our community can look out for. So we'll be launching on August 1st and doing a citywide community event October 2nd. Um, and then at the top of the page as well, you can see past projects, um, even if we've closed those for the time being. So, Let's dive into the first project. It's called Show the Places That You Love. And so Anessa will be guiding us while we look through this. But this is a tool that allows our community members to drop a pin on a map to really show their favorite places in the city. And so as they're dropping that little heart icon onto the map, they can leave comments for why it's one of their favorite places. They can add photos to make it an even more engaging tool. So really the design of this tool is intention to be very positive and playful and get them excited about participating. So the second tool that we'll be highlighting is a quick poll on public art in Arvada. And so this is really meant to be a way for residents to very quickly and easily vote on a certain topic. And it could be art, it could be housing, it could be your favorite tree that you want to go in the parks. Um, really, it's a way to warm people up to the site and teach them how to use it. Um, and since we had just adopted the Arts and Culture Master Plan a few weeks ago, we thought we'd use this as a test run to use that energy and enthusiasm around the arts. So another project that we would like to highlight is called Share Your Vision. And so in this tool, we're asking our residents to share their ideas for the future of Arvada. So it's presented like writing a postcard to the future, where we really ask our residents to reflect on what's most important to them for their community moving forward together. And so this tool allows uh, participants to brainstorm collectively and to vote on their favorite ideas. And so again, it's intention to be very collaborative and positive. So, I mean, these are just three of the tools that uh, we'll be using throughout this process. And, you know, we can swap them out and change them. It's a very dynamic site. Um, and I'll let Anessa just very briefly say a couple other benefits of using an online platform like this. Thanks, Chris. Um, I think you did a really great job of kind of showing what the user experience will be like. Um, but as Chris mentioned, there are a number of tools that we can leverage over time based on the questions that we want to hear answers to. Um, again, qualitative and quantitative feedback is what we're collecting. Um, and a benefit of this platform is that it involves, um, it includes um, moderation online so that we can keep it positive and have kind of an eye on it all the time. Um, as Carice mentioned with the idea tool, when people are sharing their visions for the future, um, we can tag kind of subjects that come up over time and we can report back um, to council or and back to the community obviously on some of those results. Um, folks are not allowed to thumbs down anyone's idea. This is really a way for people to share um, and support one another in an online um, way. Great. So now we'll let Jessica go into some of the project deliverables that you should be expecting. Great. 
So what we are envisioning for this is a short report, maybe a 10 to 20 page report that has a combination of both qualitative and quantitative um, components. The analytics on the back end of this site are very robust, I mean up to the minute, and you can categorize things in all different ways. So we intend to definitely have some graphs and analytics as part of the report and then a sort of master vision statement, which would be you are calling a, our master story, and then several value statements that we can um, all fall back on and resonate with council and everybody feels good about. And we'll also have an arts-based visual, which will come out of an artist um, reading through and seeing some of the analytics from the site, as well as an artist being at our community event that we'll have in October, where we'll take all of what we've heard so far on the site to the community and sort of gut check it with the community. Um, and so that's what we're sort of envisioning for the deliverable piece. Um, and then, this is our project timeline. We've kind of gone over, we're intending to launch um, August 1st using all of our traditional engagement tools. That'll also meet up with when the Arvada report will hit mailboxes. Um, National Night Out will be the week right after that, which will be a nice time. Then we have the community conversation in October, um, and then we have another uh, check in with council on the 26th. So all of this, you'll have this final report before the end of the year leading up into your strategic planning process at the beginning of 2019. So your role as council in this is we really want your um, engagement in this to connect with residents in your districts, to bring this up at your district meetings, um, whenever you're out and about in the community and leveraging your own networks. Um, the community connectors are willing to go out to those engagements with you um, and be some of those eyes and ears and helping hands um, for you all to partner with us. So if you guys have ideas about how we can support you and also getting out there in the community, we'd love to hear that. And then um, I'm gonna, before we jump into questions, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark for a little um, more detail about council's role in all of this. Yes, uh, thank you, Jessica. So for those of you um, on council that have held community meetings, we wanted to provide uh, a, a toolkit and a platform that can be uh, consistent. Um, the community meetings that you all hold are very different. Um, from uh, community meetings where uh, those of us that go are expected to dance and participate in rock and roll music, <laughs> um, to community meetings uh, where we uh, are uh, uh, in an elementary school setting, not dancing, but more listening to people and you know stuff like that. Um, and in some cases to community meetings that some of you hold on your own and, and, and so forth, which is just fine too. And, and, and we're not trying to uh, cramp your style in any way, but- Sounds but, like you like mine the best though. I, <laughs> that's well, what you're saying. I, I, I would have to say that I love every one of your community meetings very much. <laughs> just um, like he loves all of us. Dave, David, at my community meeting, he got to be at home. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in any case, uh, we want to provide you with, uh, uh, with, with additional tools. That's the idea about the toolkit. And then we want to also provide um, uh, a platform that uh, where, where information, however it's gathered, uh, can come back in a consistent manner that then we can report back to the community, report back to each of you on, and, and, and make sure that we're meeting your needs. I think this is, um, uh, a, 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 you know, the, the, um, the implementation of this will be a great engagement tool that I think not only staff can use and our community connectors and the others that are associated with this can use, but also that the council can use. Um, and I think we can use it in a very efficient and effective manner to get you, um, to provide you with feedback and information and, and uh, 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 you know, things that you can act on or, or you know, come back and, and utilize in a strategic planning process and in, in the process to set, uh, you know, the, our, our, you know, vision for the future that would be embodied in the next strategic plan update. Mr. Oh, right. Yeah, uh, just to clarify. So, one thing that that I think is important for you all and the community to understand is that there's kind of two things going on here. We have a, a strategic planning process that's going to start in 2019, and so we are very deliberate about wanting to deliver 
a lot of information to you in advance of that process. However, this is a, a tool, an online engagement tool that we're, we're thinking is long term. Um, if you look around, um, uh, there are a lot of communities in the United States that are using this, uh, this very platform now, uh, but it actually started in Australia. And Sydney, Australia was the first community to use this. If you go to their particular site, and I can't remember, Jessica, do you remember what it's called? Um, what is it? Or Sydney or Sydney. Sydney, well, whatever. If you go to their site, you will see a history of projects on there that is, is absolutely phenomenal. You can go back five years and you can look at the community input. So this tool can be used for a variety of things, not just what's your vision for the community, but very specific about very specific projects. One of the, one of the, um, the tiles that I saw that I thought was really fun was they were going to be landscaping a median uh, in a major street. I don't remember what city this was, but hey, community, uh, what do you want to see? What kind of trees? What kind of bushes? So it can be, it can be all over the place. So we're seeing this as, as something of a long-term uh, goal as well. The other thing I wanted to point out is one of the arrows that we're keeping in our quiver is um, the ability to do a couple of spot surveys through Northwest Research Group before um, before the end of the year, if we see some types of themes that are bubbling out of this initial process that are really, you know, very strong, that we might want to go out and do a short, quick, but statistically accurate survey to double check the data and see how how that's looking as well. Um, and oh, and one other thing that we thought about, you know, we are looking at a telephone town hall on August 8th, uh, but we're also looking at potentially a second telephone town hall later on in the year that could also add into this process. So I just wanted to add those few night notes to the conversation. Thanks, Maria. So that's all we have. So thoughts and questions. Ms. Miller. Thank you. I just have a couple of questions. Um, when will this site go live? August 1st. And then do we have any little um, handouts that we can give? We, we, uh, we're ordering all kinds of fun stuff. So, Chris, help me out. We ordered lip balms, sunglasses, magnets, magnets stickers. fun stuff. So we will provide that to all of you and to our connectors and staff that are out and about in the community. Pfeiffer. Uh, just a quick observation of just seeing this. Uh, one, I didn't see any linking with social media on any of those screens. So is there a way to share the discussion on social media to draw traffic to the site? Yes. It, I, so yeah, that would be fixed? Because that wasn't on there on the demo. I didn't see it. So. Yeah, push a button. Hit the button. Turn it on. Now? Yes, we can hear okay. you now. So you have the option to either turn that on or turn it off, and we will turn it on where they'll be able to share. You also have the option to sign up from Facebook or Twitter. However, um, the Engagement HQ has advised that it doesn't work the way people expect it to, so we will probably not turn that on. It'll be single sign up. Just we'll offer that sign up on the site. Okay. But yes, social media will be be turned on. Okay, okay, so we can go in there and start sharing it and so forth. Um, yes. Then the the only thing that popped up for me was making sure our messaging around this versus Ask Arvada, and that it's very clear. I mean, we get into this lens and focus, and we forget that people might be posting different situations on here that should have went to Ask Arvada, and and maybe we should consolidate. I don't know what that means, but I, just be aware that we're going to create some confusion with the two systems and what they're intended for without educating above and beyond with our community. I think one thing we didn't touch on is the monitoring of the site. She, and she did. Yeah. Oh, she did. Okay, so um, so we will be be looking at that and, and, and making sure that that information is parsed appropriately. There's also a who's listening on the side um, that hasn't been built into our site yet, but if you look at some of the other communities and it has, if you have a specific question or concern that you want feedback from staff, uh, then it has a who's listening with an email address. Um, we, we've thought actually about putting Ask Arvada there as well. So um, 
that would be more of the, I want a response immediate back versus providing the feedback. All right, I think that's a good linkage between this and Ask Arvada, so. All right, thank you. Very good, I don't see any other questions. I wanna really commend the community connectors for, uh, first of all, your love for this great city, and secondly, your willingness to get involved and uh, help be our ambassadors to reach out to the community. And I, what I'm really liking about this is just the positive attitude of it. So that's, that's where I was sort of struggling with this, you know, bang the table. There's a running joke with lawyers of, you know, when you've got the facts, you pound on the facts. When you've got the law, you pound on the law. If you don't have the law or the facts, you pound on the podium. And that's what I don't want to have happen right. with this. So. Right. I, I think we, it, we actually talked about that today, and there's really no reason in any of our promotional materials to refer to bang the table. This yeah. is speak up Arvada. Right. So if we want to say, hey, the software is run by, but um, our intention at this point um, is really not to even use the verbiage in, in a promotional standpoint. Right. Good. Mr. Devin. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention, you know, um, this, this effort was driven by all of you, by the feedback we've received from you, by your desire to get more engagement with the community. There's a couple of you up there that I've spent some significant time with talking about this. Um, and uh, we believe that this will help us with getting that engagement and that feedback that we've heard that you wanted. And, and as we go through this, we might have to make adjustments or do some other things along those lines. But um, this was an effort that was driven by the intentional statements that, that, that you all have made about getting, uh, making sure that we're engaged in the community. And, and that's, that's at the soul and the core of what's driving this effort. And I just wanted to make sure you all knew that. Very good. Well, thank you to staff. Thank you to fellow council members who have put this as a huge priority. And uh, with that, I, do you have anything else? No. Then we stand adjourned. <laughs>